broadcasting live from our studio in Boston. Solutions Review is proud to showcase Cloudflare in the Solution Spotlight, a unique online event for industry professionals. I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review and welcome to the special Solution Spotlight series featuring Cloudflare and focused on best practices to protect your organization from the HTTP2 rapid reset flaw, a massive record setting and ongoing distributed denial of service attack. This is a flaw that requires making patches available for virtually every web server around the world before the problem can be eradicated. This is important information you need to be aware of. So I will turn this over to Cloudflare Chief Security Officer Grant Borsikis and Cloudflare Field CTO John Engates to walk you through their presentation. Today I'm going to host a webinar which is set to be a timely and informative overview of this recently discovered critical vulnerability that's affecting the web. This is a very special briefing. I can't really stress the enormity of what is going on behind the scenes at Cloudflare, what we're working on, uh, but we'll talk through that today. And as we dig into today's topic, you'll learn all about this recently released vulnerability, uh, what's also called the HTTP2 rapid reset, and you'll hear a firsthand account of the massive DDoS attack campaign that was launched against Cloudflare that leveraged this vulnerability. So today, we are fortunate to have with us Grant Borzikas, who is Cloudflare's Chief Security Officer. Welcome, Grant. Thank you. Uh, I'm coming to you from here in San Antonio, Texas. Grant, where are you today? I am down in Austin, Texas. I'm down here visiting the office this week. Okay, so right up the road. Well, thank you for for tuning in and or chiming in today. We look forward to uh, hearing what you're up to with regards to this vulnerability. Together, uh, Grant and I will help try to explain how Cloudflare discovered the vulnerability, what we're doing to protect our customers, uh, and how we're sharing what we learned along the way with regards to this vulnerability in the DDoS uh, attack with other providers in the market to really help protect everyone. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, so Grant, it's HTTP2, it's a new zero day CVE. Can you give us a little overview of what we're talking about? Frame it up for us a bit, and then we'll get into the details later. Yes, thanks, John. So this is a new vulnerability within the HTTP2 protocol. Um, this was something we discovered um, in late August of, of 2023. Um, it is, a, you know, it, it, it's very key because I think when we looked at this, um, it was something that Google and Amazon saw as well. And so we're leading the disclosure with them, the three of us. Um, the impact, I think, is the important part here is that every DDoS mitigation vendor, including ourselves, and all web servers are vulnerable to the HTTP2, HTTP2 vulnerability. Um, you know, I always think this is interesting because there's a, you know, there is a vulnerability and there's active exploitation um, causing outages um, to systems. Why this is important is, and, and you know, when, when I kind of take a step back, the largest DDoS attack that we've seen was something we saw in February 2023 at 71 million requests per second. This, our largest one, during this period of time was a 201 million requests per second, which is three times the size, almost three times the size. Um, other things that I think are very interesting is that there were 184 attacks in the last 30 days that we've seen that were larger than the 71 million requests per second, and 107 attacks greater than the 100 million requests per second. So this is a legitimate um, attack that we've seen, much more web traffic that we've seen on layer seven. Okay, so lots of new stuff to cover. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail through the following slides, but this is just kind of the high level overview. I'll flip to the next one. And I think what's really critical here is to talk about uh, maybe the timeline, give us a little bit of timeline. You said August, but uh, what happened between now and then? What have we been doing behind the scenes and what does that bring us to uh, today? Yeah, so the first thing I think is, you know, the, the responsible disclosure process is is very important, right? And if I think about this, and, and I talked to Matthew this morning about it, is Cloudflare's mission is to help build a better internet. And and we're doing this and we're disclosing this and, and trying to get ahead of everything because of that purpose. We could have used it for advantage, but we think it's a better place if the internet's safe. And so I start there because I think when we started to look at the disclosure um, we identified and shared the, the flaw that we saw in late October of 2023 
Um, the disclosure is out today. Um, it was released at 12 UTC time. And, and part of the CVE will be um, joint ownership with Amazon and Google. Also, right, as we, as we look at this, um, you know, we've partnered with Google, Amazon, Sysa, Miter, you know, all, you know, security vendors that are relevant to this um, as part of it. So, right, this, we think this from an industry standpoint is large enough that we need to make sure that everybody is aware. Um, there's a coordinated patch rollout. So, you know, I would say make sure that you look and talk to any of your um, organizations or partners that you're looking at that have, you know, web servers or DDoS mitigation. Um, and I think for us, you know, this is part of our industry collaboration is like we're trying to give you early access to the vulnerability. Understand, you know, updates with what's going on so you can protect yourself. We'll talk a little bit later about the, you know, how this works. But I think, you know, for us, um, you know, building a better Internet is there. And the only way you can build a better Internet is to have it protected. And I think as we look at this attack and I'll share more details on the attack, you know, it's a collective group from all internet based companies, all security companies to make sure that they're protecting their customers. Yeah, so for sure, uh, it really does reinforce our mission of helping build, build a better internet. I mean, it really emphasizes our role in detecting all kinds of attacks, defending our customers, then in this case, dissecting that uh, attack and identifying the flaw. But again, you said it, you said it most importantly, disclosing what we learned responsibly so that everyone could be protected and, and really do, uh, uh, you know, support other folks in that process. Okay, so let's uh, dig into what the protocol is all about. You know, what does, what happened um, and, and what is HTTP2? I mean, you know, maybe we can break that down a bit. Yeah, so I think the first thing is we look at HTTP2 is the majority of traffic on the internet. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, so, you know, with, with over two thirds of or almost two thirds of the traffic running HTTP2, it, it's really, it's really relevant. Um, you know, HTTP2 by default is faster than HTTP 1.1. And I think that's where it is. And I always like to say from a simplistic standpoint, we're creating pipelines to be able to move traffic across the internet faster. But that, that pipeline, and, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, is, is the problem with how this rapid reset occurs, and we'll talk about that. Um, we do believe also HTTP3 um, is vulnerable, but we've not seen any exploits on this, so I think it's something to pay attention. However, HTTP1 and 1.1 is not vulnerable. Okay, so just honing in here on this, we're, we're talking about something called a rapid reset uh, in the in the protocol itself, so this isn't necessarily a coding bug, this is literally uh, protocol level uh, flaw that was abused by someone using something that was built into the protocol. Maybe I guess on the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about how that worked, how that played out. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is the best thing is to understand, you know, where we got to and HTTP 1.1, you know, for every image, um, for any of the objects that were stored on a website, there was a request and a response and it was synchronous. Um, so which HTTP 2 created is, is um, asynchronous pipeline traffic, as I think about it. So you could have multiple requests, multiple responses, um, and it sped up the internet. So you, what you see is, a, you know, you know, two thirds, or if you include HTTP three, ninety percent of all traffic is coming through HTTP two or three. Um, the problem with this is that the rapid reset attack does something very simple. You know, it, it does a request followed by a cancel, followed by a request, followed by a cancel. And so what this does is within within the session, it's creating a lot of traffic and request per second that is abnormally large. So you could request the entire website, cancel it. And so you're having bi-directional traffic that is asynchronously being driven, spiking up the request per second. And so the one thing I always think about this attack is I, I, I think there's two types of attacks. You know, what we've seen traditionally in layer three and layer four, you know, are, are you know, bandwidth attacks trying to fill up, you know, a, a huge pipeline of data. Here, this is really a, a it's a, a request per second problem. Um, and when you look at it, it'll overturn um, processor memory to, to be able to, to, to create, you know, uh, havoc with the server, loss of resilience with the server. So, you know, in, in this scenario, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the attacks we've seen, you know, it, it, this is relatively a simple and novel way to do it. Yeah, so what you're saying, layer seven, that's the HTTP layer, that's the application layer, way up at the top of the stack versus down at the network layer, 
uh, the internet itself. This is this is way up at the top. It takes a lot of resources on our side to respond. Very few resources, relatively speaking, um, from the uh, from the attacker standpoint, I would imagine. Um, so let's dig into that a bit because I think that's an important factor. What? How does that work? I mean, why why is this typical of attacks? To, are attackers using these kind of tactics against us every day, or is this something novel? Yeah, so th this is novel, and, and I think this is important. We believe that there may be one or two threat actors that are involved in this at this point. Um, but the, by the time the CV is released, you know, it's something that many people will be able to do. So um, this vulnerability is, is, is aimed, and we talk about disclosure, you know, responsible disclosures, that everybody should be prepared for this, right? It's, the, the, it's, it's relatively trivial. Um, it's novel and trivial in the sense that you know, to, to do this is you just put a request and cancel. So what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is the actual PCAP, and, and you can look at it. You know, there's a get request, there's a cancel, there's a get request, there's a cancel, um, and you see this pattern go on and on. Now, there are multiple patterns, and so when we talked about, you know, connections and, and requests per second, if you think about the amplification of this, right, you know, an 18-byte get request and, a, and plus a 13-byte cancel request, you can iterate through these very quickly. And so if you're looking at a 15-byte packet, you can get about 47 messages of cancels um, in there that will create significant CPU and memory increases, which will result into a successful DDoS. And so, you know, th this isn't something, and I think, you know, from the days of, you know, having massive botnets um, where you're creating lots of traffic, this is something that can be done relatively easily with small amounts of compute. Um, so this isn't, you know, this isn't having a million node botnet to be able to attack it. It's something that can be iterated very quickly on it. And I think that's the concern. Now there's different patterns to recognize and we'll show you on the next slide that I think is very interesting. Um, but, you know, this is a very trivial way of a request, cancel, request, cancel. But I think this is the simplicity of this is the complexity for all of us. Um, and it's something if I think there, um, I could probably do within an hour maybe less, um, just because it's it's simple to be able to do this. So one question I guess I would have is how come it took so long for them to figure this out? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, it's a great question because uh, there are some, you know, there are some CVEs out there that kind of hint at this. Um, but if you look at it, it and, and I, you know, one of the things I think about is, or two things. One is it's not really a vulnerability, it's just the way the protocol works. And so it's abuse of a protocol in a way that was never designed to do, right? So, you know, we tried to speed up the internet. So we created this pipeline that could create messages and here's what, what has happened. So very trivial to do, um, which, which is very important for us to understand. Um, you know, it, and now when we look at it, I think the simplicity makes it complex. Right. And how do we defend this? So the one thing, the, the other thing that I kind of mentioned here is, you know, the patches are not going to fix this, um, right? Is we, we can't fix the ability to do it. We can, we can you know, go back to 1.1 from an HTTP standpoint and, and remediate this, but that's probably something that we're not going to do. Um, and I think when we look at it, what we have to do is kind of reduce the number of cancels. And so, the amplification attack is really key. So you could easily see two to three times the amount of traffic that will look normal. Um, and there's not a whole lot we can do. So you know, I, I think in some ways this is more rate limiting oriented um, versus we just stop the attack. And so you know, it, it, we'll see on the next slide of, of some things that I've observed and the teams observed that I think are very interesting as we look at it. Okay, so I'll move to the next slide here. And so the thing that jumps out at me here is Cloudflare was attacked. So tell me about that, the target of the attack, what was sort of, what were they trying to aim at? What were they trying to do in this scenario? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Cloudflare was attacked, right? And so many of our customers were not attacked. It was, there were a few cases where we did see some customers attacked, but predominantly it was us, right? And I think Google would be in the same boat and Amazon. And you know, I, I can only really answer for Cloudflare, but I do think about some of the transparency and capabilities that we display publicly about our network is an easy way to be able to see if an attack works. And so, because you know we're showing connectivity in, in some of how we work, um, attackers you know can see this. And so, I remember the first night this happened, I was sitting down for dinner, and, and our head of uh, 
reliability, Jeremy Hartman sent a message and said, hey, looks like there's a new script kitty out here thinking, you know, they got a big toy, you know, they got this new weapon, it's this big botnet, right? That was the thesis. We didn't know about all of this vulnerable HTTP2, but we just saw a massive amount of traffic. And right when I look at a three time, you know, three times increases or 184 attacks in the last 30 days that were greater than what we'd seen in the lifetime of the internet, like, well, what's going on? And, and I think as we looked at this, you know, we put mitigations in place. Um, but what we thought was, you know, kind of a, you know, a, 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 you know, 17 year old, 18 year old person, you know, became very quick um, to realize, we became very quickly quick to realize that it wasn't. And so as we put defense mechanisms, what we saw were attacks were changing and morphing. And so I always think about this from a mitigation, and this is something that we all believe very true in security is we do something and the adversary does something back. It's the cat game of cat and mouse. And so I think this regression line, and I'll, I'll call this our regression line of, of mitigating technology that Cloudflare's uniquely developed because we've been fighting this attack for over 30 days, is that we put something in place and you see right after that record, you know, we, we started to manage it well, they came out with a new kind of variant of the attack. Um, and so, you know, I always like to say everything that was kind of above that regression line was something they did differently. Um, and this is, you know, kind of a sample data across these days. Anything below is what we had mitigated. And so over this time of us being attacked, we know how to defend it. You know, we have different collections of bots. One of our one of our key things is our bot service. So we've thought differently about how we do bots. We look at attacks and there's multiple mitigations in here that we can do because we see 20% of the internet, which really helps us defend this attack. Um, and I think when I look at this, were they using this to be able to be sold to another threat actor to do something? What's the purpose of this? You know, I think with where Cloudflare is in our view, right, going back to responsible disclosure is, Everybody needed to understand the mitigations that we were putting in place to make the internet a better place. And so when I look at this and you know the history of the internet and what we've just witnessed is something that you know nobody could predict could have predicted. And now, you know, if I say there's one or two threat actors that may know this, which I think is legitimately the answer today, you know, that's infinite. And so you know, many of these actors can do this and, and it's gonna be very crucial to understand what's next. And so, you know, all of us have thought about Log4j and, and all these things. And I kind of go back to Log4j, which was, hey, there's this new thing, there's a new patch. We all waited for the patch, patch didn't work. Um, in that scenario, you know, there was a new attack and there was a new thing. In this scenario, I, I use that as a parallel because I think that's gonna happen here. And it's something that I think is just because there's a patch to reduce the noise, what are they going to do next? With two people thinking about it, that's, you know, two very intelligent threat groups. Well, how many people are intelligent that can do something else to try to manipulate this? And so I think it's very important for everybody to realize, you know, Tuesday, you know, when you patch, that's not going to be the end game of where this looks like, you know, because it's abuse of the protocol and not just a vulnerability we can patch and, and, and remediate it. So um, I think that's important as well. The other question that I have had answered quite a bit is there's, you know, there's no ways to you know, exfiltrate data by this. It's purely a denial of service when I look at it. And I think that's important, but you know, if you're in a critical infrastructure or, or your, your business depends on the internet, you know, a DDoS attack of this size aimed at you is gonna be um, a, a tough attack to defend. Yeah, it's fascinating when you think about the scale here because you you mentioned 71 million back in, I think that was Super Bowl time frame in the US there where we uh, encountered that one, but it's almost 3X and obviously they're targeting Cloudflare to see what they can do, right? They're trying to see how much damage they can do. They, you know, looking at this graph, it's, you know, one of those things that in retrospect, you can see that but at the time, you know, they have to probe and they have to see what kind of effect they have because they don't have necessarily the inside view of what's going on. So it's fascinating for me to think through the, what you said was cat and mouse, this back and forth dynamic that they're trying to probe. And you know that Cloudflare is one of the largest, most distributed DDoS mitigation providers on the planet. So they're trying to use the one that you know, is sort of the most uh, 
the hardest target, right? You know, basically to see what else they can use it for after Cloudflare. Yeah, and the, the one thing I will add in addition to this, and, and I think, you know, request per second, you know, may be deceiving a little bit here. Like there may be organizations that see more requests per second. I think what we've tried to do is, right, build technology so you don't see them. Like we don't want to absorb a three or 400 million, you know, um, request per second attack. I think if we would have not put in this technology and the mitigations that, you know, our team has put in place, we may have very well seen something substantially larger. But when you get into this, you know, game of requests per second, you don't want to be over 300 or 400 million. Um, does that, you know, we can handle it. But I think when you look at bandwidth and connections and just abuse in the internet, we need to stop it before it gets to be large. And so I think you may see a trend here even that, you know, what is the largest and, and there are different ways to calculate it. But I think, you know, from a request per second, we're looking at it as we've mitigated a lot of these high requests because of the technology we've been building um, to defend our own network. And I always think that's, I always think about, you know, innovation. And this is how innovation begins is there's a huge problem that Cloudflare faced. And, you know, the organization and the engineering organization stepped up to defend it, which as a result, our customers will benefit. Yeah, so you talked about mitigations that we had to do, and maybe the next slide can talk a little bit about that, but it's this is a, a graph that my understanding shows the distribution of IP addresses that were used. And in this case, we were trying to uh, use mitigations ahead of HTTP, like IP-based jails that we were, we were using, and we were seeing them put in the IP jail, and then they were adding new resources to get themselves out of the IP jail in order to carry on. Is that how you understand the, the process or this cat and mouse? Yeah, you know, I think the easiest thing to do is, you know, you know, put an IP in jail, right? I think that's always something interesting as you look at it. You know, the way I, I look at this is each each color is a different bot. And so what they, you know, and in, in, in on the previous slide, we talked about different mitigations that they, you know, we deployed that they tried to write around and try to come up with new ways. And I, I think that's interesting. What this tells you is they weren't just trying to do different attacks on us. They were bringing new bots at us. And so, you know, now you kind of have this multi-vector attack that they're sophisticated enough and go back to, you know, sitting with dinner with my family, thinking it was a script kitty doing this. Well, you know, adapting attacks and now creating new botnets of new IPs that can do this that haven't been seen. And so, you know, that's the problem with bots is they move around, but each one of these, they'll bring a new bot on. And and what I, I love about this is, you know, hey, when they first attacked us, we were okay. Something happened in the second bot, right? They, they, they brought in new IPs, you know, they're trying different techniques. They're looking at different ways to attack us. They're trying to see how we defend it. Right. They're not, you know, when I when I think about how do we defend an attack, they're looking at how we jail IPs. They're looking at how we mitigate the request response. They're looking at how our network flows. That's a very sophisticated threat actor to do this. And so what originally thought, you know, 30 days, a little more than 30 days ago was, you know, somebody with a big toy with a big botnet is not the right answer. And it took us a while to understand what they were doing and how they were doing it. And that's why we think this is so relevant to where it is, is that the actor is there. As as this comes out from a CVE standpoint today, you know, we're gonna have to worry about different bots, right? So you know, I always think, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, well, you can patch your server. Well, what happens if it's new IPs? How are you going to defend these attacks when they're this high? And so, you know, we'll talk about mitigations that we can put in place, but, you know, don't underestimate this, this you know, abuse of the protocol because that's how the internet works. Right. And speaking of how the internet works, let's talk about how botnets work. Like, like you know, basically, uh, my understanding is they're everywhere around the planet, but what what does that tell us in in, in this graph about where these folks were coming from or where the attacks were coming from. Can you talk us through that a bit? Yeah, you know, I, I, this was something I, you know, I, I asked for and said, well, where are the bots coming from? And this looks like the world, right? You know, they're heavily dense in US and India, which is a you know, heavy amount of traffic anyway. But I think when we look at this, it, it's, well, what is, where are they attacking from us? Well, it's sophisticated bots that have IPs in, um, every country, you know, when we looked at the ASN numbers, 
It was very similar to this. It just looked like it was consistently across the internet. And remember, it doesn't necessarily matter how many IPs are, are you know, attacking because of the request per second. And I think that's a super interesting way to look at this and say, well, we don't know exactly where the botnet is because it's all over. And, and I think this, is, this, would, this would signify to me is that the botnet and the attacker sophisticated to be able to get this size of a footprint. Yeah, it really doesn't tell us really anything though about who was behind it. It just tells us where the bots were and they tend to be distributed where the internet is and where vulnerable infrastructure that's leveraged in botnets. So this is just uh, you know kind of the, the attack source, but not necessarily the person behind it. So speaking of, uh, you mentioned also mitigations, um, I guess let's talk through some of the recommendations that Cloudflare might make in order to mitigate this rapid reset attack. Yeah, so it's, this is key because people say, well, what do I want to do? And I think, you know, the first thing I always think is, you know, block layer seven traffic, which would be HTTP, HTTP2, any, any attack traffic before it reaches your perimeter. Um, we do think that if it gets inside your perimeter, it's going to be very hard to defend this. Um, that's the first thing. The second one is, you know, implement, you know, layer seven DDoS attacks. Now, with the layer seven attacks, you'll have to have SSL decryption enabled. So, you know, decrypt, inspect, um, re-encrypt. And so that's going to be important because, right, you know, if it's just HTTP 2 traffic, then you'll be able to see the traffic. But if it's HTTPS, um, then you're going to have to see what's in the actual body of the messages to be able to decrypt it. So something to pay attention there. The third one, and I think this is important, and um, it's, it's been, you know, I've been a CISA for 20 years in some large financial institutions, critical infrastructure. You know, sometimes we can get too many tools in the organization. Um, and often, right, you can see two or three or four different types of DDoS protection and, and across the spectrum. I do think in this scenario, right, having consistent control plane across the internet. Um, and when I say control plane, I mean, you know, security posture, you know, having DDoS, having WAF, all within a purview so you can see all the traffic um, to mitigate the attack holistically. So I think that is a key thing to look at because you know, how are you going to correlate all that data back when you're not seeing it? Um, the other one is, right, and, and you're going to see this today, you know, talk to your vendors. You know, if you're not using Cloudflare, talk to, you know, those vendors as well. But make sure everything's, you know, all your web servers and patches are deployed, right? And, and watch and make sure that that's there. Make it a priority. Open an instant response. Run this as, as a relevant exercise. Um, you know, in the, in, in the case of something could be potentially bad for you all, you know, turn off HTTP2 and HTTP3. Now, remember when you do this, I mean, I would do this as a last resort, you know, it's going to slow down your internet sites, you know, much. Um, I think over the last 10 years or so, right, we've seen increases in bandwidth and capabilities of websites. But if we go back to old technology, it's going to cause some problems. Um, and then, you know, the sixth one I think is very important as well. And we've seen this, I spent a lot of time in the banking industry and, you know, resilience is important. So, you know, having a control plane, but having resilience for that control plane is going to be important as well. And so looking at a secondary DDoS provider to, to help with this. And then yeah. the thing that I can be super happy about, right, is, you know, because we've been fighting this attack, we know what this attack is. You know, there's only three of us in there, but, but. You know, I think we were a big bulk of what was being attacked. If you're using us, you're protected. Um, so any of the services you have, it could be CDN, is protected with our DDoS. If you're using on your website our advanced DDoS um, capabilities, then you'll be protected as well. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, this is what we do every single day at Cloudflare is help block these attacks near where they begin. That's the nature of DDoS, they're distributed by nature, so you have to block them near the source. You don't want them to get into your network where they can overwhelm your edge capacity. That's just not the place to be doing this kind of blocking or filtering. Um, you mentioned consistent DDoS control plan. I think a lot of customers that I talk to are multi-cloud and having a consistent uh, mechanism to defend against that no matter where the attacks are targeted is super critical. Um, yes, applying patches is always important, but in this kind of a case, if they're really determined, they're going to overwhelm the um, capabilities of a single server or even a load balanced farm. And that's really why you need that uh, layer seven DDoS protection sort of at the edge. And, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with all these things. These are conversations we have every single day. So, uh, you know, with that, maybe let's uh, let's just sort of 
think about where we are. You know, this was a record breaking attack. Um, it won't be the last. You know, certainly we've we've seen a progression of these attacks over time. They can continue to be more sophisticated. The, the bad guys are determined. Uh, we deploy countermeasures on our global network and that per helps protect millions of customers around the world and and they adapt. And so will we. Um, we continue to provide free, unmetered, unlimited DDoS protections to our customers around the world. In addition, we have additional security features and measures that we can deploy uh, for organizations of all sizes. And if you need help with this, we're here to help. Uh, we would love to talk to you if you have any questions, if you're unsure about whether your infrastructure is protected or you'd like to understand how you can bolster that, we'd love to talk to you. I would direct you to our resource page, which is uh, www.cloudflare.com slash H2. We've set up a very specific set of uh, resources around the HTTP2 rapid uh, reset uh, flaw. And we've got resources there, including contact information for you, how to get in touch, uh, check this page out. Uh, and we'll continue to share more information with you as we know more. This again, Grant said, they will learn based on the release of this, they will learn how to use it uh, in different ways. And we're going to continue to adapt and we're gonna continue to share information. Now this is uh, obviously something we're, we're gonna do aggressively over the next uh, days and weeks. So um, Grant, any last, anything I missed? I wanna wrap up here, but anything else? The, the one thing I will say is, you know, in the case that you are under attack, we, we can onboard you very quickly. I've seen this, you know, dozens of times since I've been here that, you know, I have a friend of mine that, that called and said, hey, we need this, we're getting attacked, and, and we turn around and defend it for you. Um, so in the case that there is an attack, do not hesitate to go to the website, click on the button. We will call you back. We're very quick. Um, I think it's instrumental when, you know, when you, you know, if, I'm, if you're under a DOS attack, it's tremendous pressure in the organization. I've been part of those on, on, on the customer side of it. And so if there's things there, you, you'll see, you know, go to the website, click under attack, there's phone numbers, you know, please use them if you're concerned and you don't have the protection you know use use the same mechanism because the last thing we want to see is is the internet um hurt right is we're trying to build a better internet here and the only way we can do it is if, if it's safe and, and i think you know that that was you know when matthew and michelle and lee started this organization that was that's the mission it's been the mission for 13 years we just celebrated our 13th year the mission is to build a better internet and and we think that this attack could could jeopardize the health of the internet and that's why we're being very aggressive with you know we will help you um, and make sure that you're protected that's very well said grant i want to uh say a huge thanks to all the teams behind the scenes here at cloudflare who have worked tirelessly to defend our customers helping build a better internet uh, helping defend from these attacks helping shed light on this new flaw that we've discovered in http2 uh, it's truly, for me, inspiring to see the response that Cloudflare employees have had behind the scenes. Also, thank you, Grant, for walking us through this today. I know you've been super busy uh, leading the charge, getting the information out to the various folks that we've shared with uh, before the official announcement. It's super important to get that done responsibly, as you mentioned, uh, to all of our cybersecurity partners. And I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, remember, again, Grant said it, if you need help, let us know, call us hit us up on the website, or hit us up on that resource page at cloudflare.com slash H2. And thank you uh, for joining us today. Well, there you have it. This is important information and there was a lot of it in that presentation. If you need more information, you can go to cloudflare.com. We appreciate your attention to this matter. Until next time, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review. Thanks for watching.